In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Uh, I'm sure you've noticed um, the ushers, and I'm sure you've noticed some changes uh, started to happen in attempting to have the uh, Sunday service organized and uh, more a time for us to pray and focus and learn and, and of course, partake of communion. So I ask you, uh, I expect the church will get a little bit filled up as the liturgy progress. I ask you to be cooperative, please, uh, with the ushers as they direct you to uh, communion. Nothing changed as far as the communion, how communion uh, will take place. Just be cooperative uh, with them. It's their first day, and so I'm sure it might not be uh, easy for, uh, for them. Um, we'll give you more details on this at the end. Um, of course, you know the story of today's. You know uh, the feeding of the multitudes. So the Lord uh, sent the disciples ahead of him. And then they came back and they wanted to share with him what really happened with them as they went before him in every city and every town he was about to, about to go to. And because they were tired, they wanted to go in a secluded place where they can rest a little bit. And so they went into a secluded place uh, around uh, the lake of uh, Gennesaret or the Sea of Galilee. Uh, which that city, by the way, is a city that has Jews and has Gentiles. So you think about it, it's, it's a city that really doesn't have Jews who are very strict. It's actually Jews who are willing to live a little bit with some Gentiles. It's, you know, and so, and so that's really the city where this uh, miracle has taken place. Much of the Lord ministry also goes around, definitely in Capernaum, but also around the Sea of Galilee, uh, especially also in Bethsaida, because we know later on he comes and he says, Woe to you, Bethsaida, for many miracles were, were, happened in you, and he did not believe. But so the Lord takes uh, the disciples and go into the secluded place, and a multitude follows them. And the Lord, out of the kindness of his heart, he received them, and he teaches them, and he heals those who needed healing. But then as the day uh, went on, they started to get tired, and it started to get you know dark, maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit before that. And the disciples, concerned about the people, said, just ask him to, to leave and to go to find food and a place to sleep in a deserted place of course you know he uh, he said to them you give them food and he said we have only five loaves and two fish and so he takes the five loaves and the two fish and he looked up and he blessed and he broke this probably sounds very familiar to what we do here on Sunday. These words of he looked up, he blessed, he broke. These three actions remind us almost immediately was what we do here on Sunday, right? It remind us immediately with, with the Eucharist, remind us immediately with the breaking of, of the bread. Of course, we have a much more account, a much more longer uh, discourse, a much more longer teaching the Lord does in John chapter 6 and not in, in Luke. But this reminds us with this looking up, blessing, and breaking. By the way, and giving back to the people. By the way, this is like what I said, this is exactly the liturgy. This is exactly the liturgy. And it's a very simplest form. What God gave us, what He provided for us, flour and wine, we take that in simplicity 
and we offer it to God, we pray and we ask Him to bless it and to give us back His body and blood to feed us for eternity. They're the very basic actions. And in fact, we have to think about the liturgy in this way. This is really the heart and the, and the core of the liturgy. Is that we offer to God that which we have, that which is very simple. He takes it, He blesses it for us, and gives it back to us. His most precious body and His most precious blood to feed us. And to give us not only feeding for now, but he give us eternity through it. Now, this miracle, you know, it's mentioned in the four Gospels. It's probably the only miracle, aside from the account of resurrection, that's mentioned in the four Gospels. And in the four Gospels, this miracle is preceded by John the Baptist, something about John the Baptist. In the four Gospels, John the Baptist is mentioned right before this. And sometimes you find a little bit long account about John the Baptist, and sometimes you find just two verses about John the Baptist. And you wonder, why is John the Baptist related to the feeding of the multitude? I mean, you, you got to wonder why. What does John the Baptist has any, anything to do with this? And I think this is important for us to understand. It's important for us to understand that this miracle almost marks, almost marks the end of prophecy according to the Old Testament. If John the Baptist resembles the end of the prophets according to the Old Testament, he's mentioned right before this as he was beheaded. And now you have Christ who feeds his people, not according to the prophets, but according to his very own power. So John the Baptist is always mentioned before that to tell us and to, to, to tell us and to tell the first readers of the Gospels, open your eyes. There is a transition happening here. And that transition is the Old Testament, including John the Baptist ends here. And now we enter into almost the time and the ministry of Christ. When we come to understand the Gospels, we need to understand it in the context and in the way those who heard it understood it. And then we, if we understand what they understood, we can take what they understood and apply it to us. Okay? So now, those who have seen Christ looking up to heaven blessing the five loaves, breaking and distributing, and everyone out of the 5,000 ate, and they had even left over with them, they had to remember a very important person in their minds. They had to remember who? They had to remember Moses. Because it was Moses who fed the people where? In the wilderness, right? It was Moses. Moses took the people out of Egypt, they were in Sinai, they were hungry, and when they were hungry, they complained. He said, we're hungry, we want food. And Moses goes to talk to Aaron, and both of them speak to God, and God says, I'll give them the manna to eat. But Moses gave them the manna next day. Moses did not give them the manna on the same day, by the way. First time the people received the manna, received it next day. Actually, when you look into Moses' miracles, the plagues, quite few of them, they happen next day. They don't happen on the same day. They happen next day. For example, the death of the livestock, the animals of the Egyptians, that happened in the next day. The locusts that came on Egypt, that happened and the next day did not happen at the moment. And that for Moses was important because for Moses, this was two things. One, God was foretelling his people what he's about to do. So when it happens, they understand 
Oh, it was our God who performed this miracle for us. Two, it was not done by the power of Moses. It was to tell the people that it was done by the power of God. But Christ's miracles always happen when? They always happen now, at the moment. Because He is God and He is present and He needs no time for tomorrow and He needs no more prophecy because He is present. So all the Lord's miracles happen at the moment. So He takes the bread, He looks up to heaven, He blesses, He breaks, He gives, He feeds all of them, all of that at the moment. Not tomorrow. It happens now. This miracle also followed by something very important. This miracle followed by the Lord asking the disciples, who do the people say that I am? And they say, oh, some said the prophet, some say you're Elijah, some say, you know, you're that prophet. And he says, now, what do you say that I am? And that question, by the way, strikes the disciples. That's not easy. What do you know about me? Not just what, what do you know, but who am I to you? That's an important question the Lord asks the disciples and, and Peter jumped in and he says, you are Christ, the son of God. That word Christ was so important to them because this is what they waited for. They waited for the Messiah. They waited for the one who fulfilled the prophecy, the one who comes to save them, the one who comes to fulfill the law and the prophecies, the one they've always waited for. You are the Messiah, the Son of God. This revelation happened to Peter, according to Luke, after this miracle. Because it is Christ and it is the Son of God who feeds. It is the Son of God who teaches. It is the Son of God who heals. So Peter sees these things and recognizes, I'm standing before the Messiah. I'm standing before the person that I'm, waited, I'm waiting for for a very long time. Now, did he really understand all that? Yes, they did. They did. The Jewish people were not clueless about the prophecies. They knew the prophecies. They knew their books. They waited for the Messiah. And when he came, the people knew him. The Pharisees and the high priests, their heart their hearts were hardened and they did not see him, but the people knew who he is. And it took them some time. They, you know, sometimes they knew and sometimes they did not know. Sometimes they were confused, but, but that's all okay. It's according to their measure. But then today he comes and we see Christ. We see two things important to our lives. One, we see someone that may be a child who offers all what he's got. What do you have? I have five loaves and two fish. When in a deserted place, there is no food. Can I have your lunch? Sure. But the heart of giving, the heart of generosity, the heart of willingness to give is so important that we open our eyes to see that. This heart of, of willingness to, to give and to give all what I have is so important. And I think we miss that. We miss the ability to, to, to be able to share even simple, small things. We notice, by the way, it's hard now to teach our kids to share things, right? It's hard to teach a child to share a toy. It's hard to teach a child to share a candy. It's, it's hard to... To, 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 to teach an adult to share something that's valuable to them. But that's, that was the spirit of the gospel. And the Bible clearly spoke about, do not neglect to show hospitality to the strangers, that spirit of welcoming and generosity and giving and being open-hearted to receive people is very important. And we, all of us need to learn how to do this. The other thing is that God provides for us. This is part of 
of what we call God's providence. His goodwill, his goodwill, his care for us revealed in the time and in the way that he wants it for us. The Lord truly cared for the people and truly cared for their hunger. And so he gave them food. He truly cared for, cared for, for their health. And so he healed them. He cared that he teach them. So he taught them. And so what does that tell us about God providing to us? By the way, there is nothing good in our lives <coughs> except that which is provided from, from God. God is a source of goodness for everything that we have. We tell him in the liturgy, for the eyes of everyone wait upon you, for you give them their food in due season. It's a God who provides. Those, almost, those words are almost taken out, almost literally, from, from this miracle. For the eyes of everyone, for the eyes of the five thousands, wait upon you, for you give them their food in due season, in the proper time you feed them. And so God provides for us all. Matthew says, the Gospel of Matthew says, Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin, and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will? You know what's a copper coin? A copper coin. It's like now they translate it as a cent. A copper coin is one sixteenth of a denarii. One sixteenth of a denarii. A denarii is the wages for one day worth of work. So you figure out one sparrow worth 15 minutes of work. Not the point, of course. The point is that something so insignificant in God's creation, it's insignificant to us, but it's significant to him, let alone us. We worry so much about things we worry about what we eat and what we drink. We worry about how God will provide for us in the future. We worry about retirement. We worry about savings. We worry about our homes. We worry about our children. And, but God comes and says, even when a sparrow will not fall to the ground without your father's will, that I care for you. And so God provides to us. God cares for us. And we need to live knowing this. We need to have the faith knowing that God provides. We need not to worry. I invite many of the younger ones, the youth, that I, and many times now I hear they're stressed, they're panicking, they're overwhelmed about things. I hear these words from junior high and high school and college of course but even from as young as junior high and high school I, I, I hear words like I'm stressed I invite everyone to go back and read this miracle to Christ the Son of God who provides to all and glory be to God forever Amen.